Hi there, uh, welcome to the Bridge Church midweek broadcast once again. Um, my name is Chris Scott, I'm going to be your host, I'm the senior minister here at the church and we want to give you a very, very warm welcome. Um, whether you're local to us, uh, whether you're joining us again, you were with us on Sunday or maybe you are somewhere exotic in the world and you've just tuned in to be with us for these next few minutes. Well, we want to uh, welcome you and uh, hope that you have a, just a great time with us today. We're going to be bringing part three of our current series from Ephesians called Sit, Walk, Stand. Uh, it's Paul's perspective on life and uh, Simon English is going to be bringing part three of that to you in a little while and I'm sure that's going to be a real blessing to you. But before we move on, I want to just read something to you and hopefully encourage you from God's Word. And it's from Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 5. And Paul writes these words. If anyone else thinks that he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, then I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and in regard to the law, a Pharisee, and as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. But, what a, a powerful word this is, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything, and I consider everything rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through Christ, uh, faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I don't know about you, but sometimes people are very, frustrate, very, very frustrating when they don't take responsibility for things that they should take responsibility for. But likewise, it's equally frustrating when people do take responsibility for things that are not their responsibility. And I think that's what Paul is getting at here. He's saying we, you know, we cannot take responsibility for our own salvation, for our own forgiveness, even for our own freedom. He says, why do we put confidence in ourselves and take responsibility for those things that Christ has already not only take a responsibility for, but has fully paid the price for. So that's a real encouragement for us today. I don't know where you are coming from. I don't know where you're at in your own world or in your own life at the moment, but that's Paul's encouragement today that we can consider everything as, and he calls it dung. I mean, it's quite a powerful thought, really. It's quite an image. Um, everything that we try to do, everything that we take responsibility for, that pertains to our salvation is like stinky old, you know, manure when compared to what Christ has already done for us. So that's a real encouragement for us uh, this morning. I'm going to pray uh, and then we're going to move on with our broadcast today. Father, we thank you that there is nothing more that we could ever do to earn our salvation, that, that there is no reason for us to have confidence in ourselves or in the flesh, or, or, or think that in some way we can attain to righteousness and to salvation. We thank you, Lord, that all of that counts for nothing. All of that is like stinky manure in comparison to the incredible, amazing work of Jesus Christ on the cross and this morning or today as we gather around your word again as we come into your presence we share a few moments together today I pray that by your Holy Spirit you will encourage us you will cause us to look to you you will cause us to discard anything that hinders us from knowing you and knowing your salvation 
in our lives. I pray a blessing over everybody that's tuned in today. Pray, Lord, that whatever is said, whatever is done, that uh, they will be encouraged and uplifted and challenged by our time together today. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to come to our notices now and uh, we're going to play you the notices video as we say every week. There's a lot going on. Um, if you've seen the notices video before, please try not to just tune out. Um, just try and make a note of some of the things that are going on and we would love you to participate and to be part of that. So over to the notices. Well, as I said, there's a lot going on. We'll just flag up a couple of things. Um, the marriage course is still available for you, probably at least until this week. Otherwise, you'll be too far behind and you have to do the next one. Um, but if you are interested in doing the marriage course, you would like to start that tomorrow, then please do give us a ring here at the bridge and we'll put you onto Yenny and Yenny can get you booked into the marriage course. Secondly, just to flag up again on Monday the 28th, we do have uh, my brother actually Ben who's an elite uh, fitness coach and well-being coach works up in the city and he's going to come and do a workshop with us on Monday the 28th starting at 7.30 and uh, that will be on the, the subject of handling stress. So it's going to be just actually a stress-free evening, a relaxed evening, we we'll do some coffee, have the workshop, bit of Q&A, a little bit of feedback and uh, hopefully that will be a really enjoyable evening. If you want to be part of that, then please do book in. Okay, you can, you can book in via the website or you, as you can see now, the slide has come up. You can point your phone at that, the QR code, and you can get yourself booked in. Just finally, actually, would also say we are currently, I think, uh, 494 subscribers to our YouTube channel. So if you are a regular, if you do tune in and you haven't yet subscribed, it would be great for you to subscribe. It would be great to get our subscription over 500. Um, just that we know that not everyone joins us all the time, of course, um, but please do click that and also click the like if you want to be part of that. Well, we're going to uh, move on and take up our, our offering. Um, this is something that we do every week and again, I know that over the last couple of years it's all been done a bit weird, we've been doing it digitally via QR code. I do just want to say that on Sunday coming we are going to recommence doing physical offerings. As of uh, Thursday the 23rd, 24th I think it is this week, the government, all the government measures to do with Covid are being relaxed so we are pretty much back to normal or how we were prior. I know there's a few things still in place, of course, um, but that means that we're gonna try and move back as, as normal as possible. So we will be taking a physical offering 
on Sunday. That's for those of you that are going to be with us. But here's your opportunity. The QR code is going to come up behind me. Um, and uh, here's your opportunity to give if you are a regular part of the Bridge Church. If you call the Bridge Church your home, then this is your opportunity to give. And uh, you just point your phone at the QR code. It'll take you to our giving page. There's a, a drop down menu and you can um, sign up or you can make a, a, a donation or a payment um, to any of the, the causes that are there, including your tithes and offerings. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that and I'll be back with you in just a second. Okay, so um, we come to the Word of God. Like I said at the beginning, um, this is part three of our current series in the book of Ephesians called Sit, Walk, Stand. Um, I kicked off the first couple of weeks talking about our position, our identity in Christ, um, what a privilege it is for us to be seated with him in heavenly places. And if you didn't catch last week's preach, I would really encourage you to do that because that sets you up for everything else that is to come over the next few weeks. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Simon. Simon preached on Sunday. We're going to join him as he just begins to open up and unpack um, from Ephesians chapter 3. So over to you, Simon. And so from that, we then jump into chapter 3 and 4, to sh and, he, and, he, and Paul starts to show us how this is how it works. So you've been given identity in Christ. This is what Christ has, has done for us. This is the, the unity that he wants to set about in us. And then he comes to chapter 3 and 4 and says, Right, church, this is now how I want you to, um, to live that out how I want you to come into that. And so this is what I want to sort of unpack a little bit more today is he shows us the walking aspect that when we as believers come into the revelation, we will transform our daily tra testimonies of his glory, which is at work in our lives. So in these two chapters that I want to kick off, um, yeah, he, he, he's... He's encouraging the Ephesian church to, to pursue, but it also stands so prevalent for us as the 21st century church. And so Ephesians 4, verse 1, I'm just going to just read verse 1 at this particular stage, but we'll come back and, and read uh, a couple of verses after that. It says, Therefore I, Paul saying, the prisoner of the Lord. Do you consider yourself a prisoner of the Lord today? It's such an interesting statement that we would be someone who is literally so, um, so committed, so uh, bound to the cause of Christ that we would consider ourselves to be prisoners. It's an interesting term, but maybe the Spirit has something very significant for us in saying that. He says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner which is worthy of the calling with which you have been called. You know, we've been called, as we've heard, to be seated um, in, in position with Christ, both intimately and heavenly. But how does that, how does that out, get outworked in our day-to-day -day lives? You know, the, the perception, the, the, the image, yes, I could, see, uh, the, yeah, I could see the image of me being seated next to Christ. But what purpose is that if I'm seated there when actually I'm walking on this earth and he's got me, you know, in, a, in the day-to-day -day grind of life? And how is it that we can carry that heavenly perspective in our day-to-day -day life, walking it out and, uh, and not feeling as though we have to be too far up and high and uber spiritual and totally um, irrelevant to the world, and yet bringing this gospel message, this gospel power, which is, uh, which is wanting to do in and through us. So as we unpack the next couple of verses and Paul's prayer for the Ephesians in chapter 3, we'll see the characteristics that we as the church are being called to walk so a world knows that we belong to him. I want to sort of kick this off, really, I guess, with a, a walking story. And um, I don't know whether you, um, whether you remember where you were for um, New Year's Eve 1999 going into 2000. Um, I was uh, I was a 17 year old uh, young lad, very keen to head up to uh, head up to Westminster Bridge, be part of all of the revelry of what was going on, 
And so as a group of, group of friends, we've made this conscious decision that we were going to go up and, and uh, see the fireworks and, 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 and see what was going to unfold. But we'd, the only plan that we'd really actually made was like a meeting point. We we're going to come together at this particular station uh, at, at Embankment, and then we were going to walk up the Embankment and, uh, and head across to Westminster Bridge. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a short walk <laughs> by any means. But also, it's not a short walk when you're completely unprepared for the evening. And we were literally, we went with no food, no drink, literally just ourselves, and, uh, you know, warm jackets and, and all the rest of it. But you saw the masses of masses and masses of people that were queuing up for, for, for food, uh, food trucks and, and things along those lines. And, and in yourself, you're like, ah, oh, you know, there's... The queue's way too big, you know, not interested. We'll go to the next one. We'll try and get the next one, next one, next one. But they were, every single place was absolutely packed and, and full to, to, to the brim, to the point that we literally, we got ourselves to, to Westminster Bridge. We'd had no food, no drink for, you know, goodness knows how many hours. And the whole experience by the end of it was like, oh, what on earth are we doing here? We're cold, we're tired, we've walked a good 15, 20,000 steps undoubtedly. And, and, then, and then, you know, the fireworks went off and we thought, oh, okay, what was... What, 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 almost, what was the point of that? We got back on the train to Waterloo, back to Fairlop, and, and went to join some friends at a, a, um, at a house party. But by the time we got there, all their food had run out. There was, there was hardly any, any drink to be had there. And so my friend Chris and I walked all the way from Fairlop back to South Woodford. And, and you just can imagine how waned we were by, by the end of it, you know, and just it it was bonkers but the 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 saving grace was that when you come around george lane and you just come past the the george pub on the corner there the lights of chicken cottage were lit up and we both had a bucket of chicken each and it was like the saving grace of the evening i mean why why do i tell you that story when we walk in um uh or or or, or go on a particular journey there are certain reasons why we've gone on that journey in the first place. We've gone with, with intention or with, uh, with, with a purpose. You might be walking with a friend, and so the intention is to, to catch up with that person, to spend time with them. Other things, um, other reasons that we walk is that we're walking to get to a particular destination. But I think what God sort of taught me in and through that particular incident is that we can have the destination in mind but without the pursuing of what is going to happen in and throughout the journey, the actual walk, we can be completely blindsided and we can fall off the bandwagon from, what, from actually reaching our destination in the first place. My destination was not Chicken Cottage, get me? Like it was not the first thing on my mind when I thought of, hey, New Year's Eve 2000. But it ended up being the final destination to, to, to fulfill a physical need. But I just I think there's there's this this thing that God's teaching us as we unpack the um, these scriptures in Ephesians three and four that you know we can be totally unprepared for the long walk ahead. We can know the destination of where we're headed, but the preparedness of what will be needed for the journey can be the blind spot. And so what is what is Paul gonna draw out? to us in and through this scripture in, in Ephesians 3 to declare that this is the thing that I'm, I'm going to prepare you with. This is, the, the, this is the key which is going to help as a foundational um, block that when you walk together with other believers, when you walk together as a church, that this will be the foundation that will actually support you along, along the journey, as well as in our day-to-day -day lives when we walk with, uh, with people at work, as in our schools, and in our universities. So let's unpack this. Ephesians 3, verse 14 to 19. If you've got your Bibles, open it up. I'm going to be reading from the uh, NIV version this morning. So from, from verse 14, the context is, you know, Paul has, has declared, you know, that he's, he's spoken about the grace that has been given to him in order to preach this gospel to to reveal this this next level mystery 
which is that the word of God, that the gospel message is, a, is available now to, to the Gentiles uh, as much as it is for, for, the, uh, for, for the Jewish nation of, of Israel. And he then, he then says, by that grace, I'm now called to, um, to, to do this. And from verse 14, it says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. I just want to stop there just for a second. That this deposit, this life that he's wanting to pour into us, that when we sit with him, when we're, when we're in a place of, of intimacy, there is there's time to share. There's time to ask questions. There's time to unravel that which is on our heart. But in those moments when we listen and when we pursue him purely for, for finding out what, what it is that is his will, for our lives, what it is that he's wanting to declare. It's in this place that his glorious riches, it says, want to be poured out into each and every one of us through the power of the Holy Spirit into our inner beings. You know, I love a, um, uh, I love a, a God experience as much as anybody else. I love being filled with with the Holy Spirit in meetings like this, whether it during, during praise or worship or someone praying for me, and that's fantastic. And we can feel the, um, you know, we can we can feel the chills, we can feel the, uh, the 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 good feelings. But God is wanting to do a deep inner work in us. It's not surface level. And this inner work, He says, I love this because when He says so that. There is purpose behind what it is that he's wanting to actually deliver into our inner being. It says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That word dwell is so crucial to us, church. Because I think, I, I know it for my, my own life and, and for my own circumstances. There are times when I, I, I don't allow Christ to dwell within me. There is this sojourning. Um, relationship that goes on and and yet God is calling he's saying look I want to dwell in your heart I want to take deep root I want to take the the first place position in you so that this incredible power through the Holy Spirit may come upon us it may be part of our everyday living that as we walk from place to place we're not um, we're not striving in our own strength we're not relying upon um, on things that are are of this world, but that we're relying upon His Spirit to to uh, to transform us. And Paul goes on to say, "I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power that same power that He's prayed before, together with all the Lord's holy people, to just just grasp how how wide, how long, and high and deep is the love of Christ." And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This being rooted and established in love, it is to be part of our walk, it is to be part of who we are. And yet, again, like as I say, if we are in, if we're believers who 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 choose to to sojourn in and out of that place of allowing the Spirit of God, allowing Christ to dwell in us, we can, we can muddy the water in terms of what that love looks like. You know, we can have a, we can have a perspective. We can have a, um, you know, we've, we were talking sort of recently about sort of the dimensions in which God reveals himself. You can have one particular dimension, but actually he's, he's drawing us to, to see the full structure to see the full picture of his love. And so as we get as we we're being called into being rooted into his love, there is to to be this overflow that comes from us. It's not something that we just bottle up and 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 accept the the warm fuzzy feelings for ourselves, but it is to to overflow, it's to become our nature, it's to become who we are. And I love it in that verse 19 it says and and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You know how many of us walk around with the head knowledge that God loves us? But actually, to know this love is actually a heart matter. It's a heart matter that he's drawing us into himself. 
that we may know his love, that it may be something that transforms us. That isn't just something that, oh, you know, I have a, uh, I can communicate it, you know, off the top of my head. I can, I can, you know, relay it to you. But actually, the outworking of that is something that is, is, has come by the power of his spirit, by, by him revealing himself to us, whether that be through prayer, whether that be through opportunities to uh, be with him face to face in that place of intimacy. It's such an incredible prayer. And a prayer that I think as we, we walk out our lives is, is one of those things that is to be regenerating us. You know, it's not just, hey, uh, Simon, I'm depositing the, the in, insurmountable love of, of God into you and off you go. It is relationship. It's relationship love. It's love that makes you go, wow, I, I'm, I'm thirsty for more of it. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the same type of experience that the woman at the well said, uh, had with, with Christ. You know, like, you, you want to pour water that will quench your thirst for now, but I have water, I have life that is available to you that will, you know, means you will, you'll never thirst. It, it's, it's, it's just that desire to go back and back again. And I, I think this, this reality that we, as the church, are, are walking in is this, it's not a love that is, is built purely on the flesh or self-satisfaction. It's a love that's beyond our own capability to muster up in our own strength. And I realized this, you know, um, uh, when, uh, when reading 1 Corinthians um, 13, you know, Paul five years earlier is actually uh, writing to the church of Corinth this love that we are called to walk out. Now, often it's the, the scripture that gets so often used at, at marriages, um, and I don't, don't knock that at all, but it's, but it's so much about uh, the way in which we are called to love one another within the church, how we're called to love one another outside of the church, um, and, uh, and, it, and, and the demonstration and, and the experience of that. So, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 8, uh, to 8. I just want to just unpack that again just a little bit because I think if we're, if we're being asked and we're being called to, to grasp how high, how wide, how deep this love is that is to be our, our foundational place from walking as we walk um, in, in our daily lives, it's important to know what that love looks like, right? And so Paul again writes, he says, I speak, if I speak in the, in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And yet this is what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I think it's important that you can't separate those first four verses, uh, first three verses with, with the other ones because, um, you know, it's part of uh, the chapter from, from, um, from defining this, this love. You know, he, I think he knows that as he shares this with the church that it can become a comparison game, you know, a bit of a tick box thing. Oh, well, you know, I'm pretty good at not being envious. I'm pretty good at, you know, not, not boasting about my love. But actually, there are people in the church that are saying, well, you know, but actually I... You know, I'm involved in, 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 in healing ministry. I'm in, involved in, in prophesying and bringing, you know, powerful words into people's lives. And yet we see again sort of early, earlier in Matthew 7 that, that Christ says, hey, you know, you, yes, you prophesied. Yes, you performed miracles. Um, yes, you, you did all of these things in my name, but I never knew you. And it comes back to, hey, church, when we sit... When we sit, are we pursuing this love, <laughs> this love that is, that is him, that is Christ, that is his, his person, his nature, his character? And from that place of, of receiving that love, do we walk from that position? Or do we walk from a position where we're, 
we're, we're more in, interested in, in the doing rather than doing from a place of being. And I think that's the, that's, that's the crucial thing to, to understand. I wonder if we can honestly say that this kind of love is the one that we're walking in as the church of Jesus Christ. I think it's important that we, re, we, we ask God, where are we at on that journey of love? You know, am I patient <laughs> with my love when my kids <laughs> just continue to wind me up with let it go for the 15th time in the car? <laughs> am I, you know, am I someone who, who keeps no record of wrongs? You know, I think we, we very often hold that premise of, oh, I can forgive you, but I can never forget what it is that you did. And yet the scripture says, hold no record of wrongs in our love for one another. Such a massive challenge, but yet Christ modeled that to us and models it to us to this very day, that he holds no wrong against you as we are his followers and as we choose to believe in him and believe that his gospel was, is for us. So church, yeah, I just, um, I'm, I'm wanting us to, to grapple first and foremost that this love is not a, fim, a flimsy love that he's, he's prepared or called us in. It's a, a love that, is, that, that goes beyond anything that we ourselves can comprehend, but yet is so tangible and so receivable by the power of his spirit. It is something that you and I can come into and that we can pour into the lives of, of those that, that are so desperately needing his love right now. And I think it leads us back to the, the fact that this love that we're called to walk in is a work of the Spirit and the importance of us welcoming the daily dwelling presence of God in our lives just cannot be... Um, you know, it can't, it, it can't be... Um, What's the word? You know, when um, you know, we're misrepresented, it can't be something that we, we, we just choose to, to let go by, by the wayside. And, you know, I'm challenged by Christ's life. I'm challenged by the way in which he, he walked in his daily life to, to, to see the needs that were in the community around him. You know, I think when we, when we read Scripture, we... We, we focus a lot, definitely, on, on the premise that Christ took um, time to, um, uh, to separate him, himself, uh, to, to, to be in solitude with God, to receive what it was that he was being prepared for for that particular day. But I love also in John 5, 19, when he's being challenged by, uh, by the, the Jewish authorities about performing miracles on the Sabbath. He says, Jesus gave them this answer very truly, uh, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. And I think sometimes we can complicate matters in thinking that we need to hear this audible voice. Or, um, or why am I not, you know, why am I not receiving anything in, in, in my prayer life when, you know, when I'm so desperate to, um, to, to see God through come in my life? Um, or, or, in, or being instructed before we, we, we even perform an act of love um, uh, for, for people that are in our lives. And yet, you know, I was saying this to, to Chris earlier in the week, you know, if it's an act of, of love in accordance with his scripture, should we not be people who do that, who, who, who just act out of love and instead of, you know, thinking that we need three confirmations from the Holy Spirit and a, uh, and a, and a dog and a, and a cat to fly in the sky? You know, it's, it's, the, it's the premise that if love is our foundation and we have been transformed by love, then we ourselves are called to love and called into love. You know, I've had this um, so beautifully demonstrated recently, and I was sharing this at the week um, in the week of prayer with with our little um, small prayer group. Um, Olive and I, we were dropping off a friend uh, in uh, Leytonstone um, from from a play day, and as we were coming back, we came to a set of traffic lights, and there was this young man who was standing by the by the traffic lights, who was begging for um, for for money. 
And this was Olive's first experience of seeing um, someone who, who was poor um, doing something like that. I mean, she'd seen people sat on the, on the street and so forth, but somebody literally coming door to door at the cars um, asking for money. And, you know, I don't carry cash on me, but you could, I, I could hear Olive just sort of in the back seat, just having this real conviction of spirit that she wanted to do something for this gentleman. And we drove off that um, from, from that particular um, traffic light. We got home, and we'd had a, well, we were having like a takeaway that evening, and uh, we ordered sort of like our, our regular Chinese that we have. And, uh, and the Chinese turned up, and the order was wrong. How much do you hate that in Deliveroo and Uber? Just get your order wrong. And, and you're like, well, look, I've got to eat it anyway, so don't worry. But they're like, no, don't worry. We're going to send you out your chow mein. We're going to send you out another plate. But by which point, you know, you, the rest of the food will be cold, and so you just eat it. But in that moment when, when the chow mein landed in our house, and it was, I sat down and I had the plate, Spirit just immediately said, give it to the man that you saw at the traffic lights. And, and I, to be honest, I knew it wasn't just a, a word for me in that particular time. I shouted out to Olive, who was in the room. I said, hey, Olive, do you want to come on a Holy Spirit journey? And she was like, yeah, awesome. Let's do this. Excellent. So she knew what it, you know, who it was that we were going, going to, to search out for. And so she got this bag ready. We put the chow mein in. She pulled out some pocket money, just literally two pounds. But just from the heart of babes, that was what she knew was, was, was what she was called to do in that moment. And, um, and I said, look, it's been three hours because it was like five o'clock when we dropped off. It was eight o'clock now. I said, I don't know if this man will be here, but we, we pray and we believe. And so we, we drove back to the, these traffic lights. And lo and behold, there's this guy who's literally just about to, to leave at the point that we pull up. And so we pulled over the car. We got talking to this guy. His name's Lucas. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's from an Eastern European uh, nation. And I said, look, I need you to know that this girl has been praying for you. From the moment that she saw you, she had a heart for you. And I said, look, we just want to bless you. We just want to love you and, 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 and pray with you right now. And it's beautiful because you literally got all these cars that are just looking out the window going, what on earth are these guys doing as you've got eyes shut and you just got a hand on? And he was just absolutely blown away at the generous heart, the love posture of a nine-year-old girl that would give just of what she had. As a church, it's like this is a, a challenge to us that when we receive this love, what is it doing in us? What is it stirring up in us in the people that we come into contact with, with the people that we see? And I, you know, I've, I'm, I've got no doubt that Ginger, uh, Oliver, at some stage, she's going to be working in that field because it's just something that is so on her heart. She, ha she hates to see destitution. She hates to see people who cannot provide for themselves. And yet there was just incredible love that was poured out in that situation. And I just want to share with you four very quick things that I think we can be a part of that help us to know that we're walking in the manner of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a manner which is worthy of the calling that is on our lives. And it's first and foremost, it comes back to this intimacy thing, is prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Position yourself in, in, in a place in which you're praying and as we and 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 I'm 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 talking about what what stems out of our our place of of love here. So again, back to this 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 prayer that um, that that Paul has prayed for us that that we would come into knowing the the depths of this love for us. And when we pray out of that position of love, the the incredible things that can come into being. Think of Acts 12. And, and Peter is in, in prison. He's put in prison by King Herod. And yet there's these devoted people who out of love for their brother gather together in, in prayer. And whilst they are praying, an angel 
comes and and sets the chains free from Peter's uh, ankles and his wrists. He opens the door and is able to be set free from the prison. And when Peter lands on the doorstep of the people, they think he's a ghost. They can't believe the significance of their prayers that have been at work. And yet the reality was is that God heard, God listened. That position of love, that walking position of, Lord, I give you my brother. I give you my sister who is in need at this particular time. And I pray for transformation. I pray for change in their life. Believe, church, that he will come. And he will come good of his word to to perform an incredible work in the lives of people that when we pray. I think praise is something that is so crucial. Something that's so important to us as well. That leads us to this place of, um, of humility and utter dependence upon God. 2 Chronicles 20 and uh, King Jehoshaphat is, a, again, a beautiful, beautiful picture in which, the, you know, the, the Israelites are just, they, they have these armies coming down, coming down towards them. They, they feel as though there is absolutely no hope. And yet the Spirit of the Lord comes upon, uh, I can't remember his name, but one of the Levites um, uh, uh, that, 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 that was, and, and says, look, this is the plan. This is the intention. This is what we need to do. And Jehoshaphat comes through and says, do you know what? We're going to have people who lead our army in praise. We're going to lead our, our army in worship. And as we praise and as we worship, our eyes are lifted to a different perspective on our own situation. And we open ourselves up uh, to, to, to receive from the Spirit for those that we care for. I'm just sitting over here and I'm going, Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for the words that you turn. <laughs> you turn bones into armies. That you turn seas <laughs> into highways. Like God's power is far greater than my own ability. Far greater than anything that I can, I can muster up or produce in my own strength. And in that place, it helps me to, to go into, into my week on a regular basis. I don't just praise here on a Sunday, guys. Make it a daily occurrence within your life to factor in praise, to factor in worship into your God, worshiping to your King of Kings, so that it is actually a, a, a place that you you stem from when you when you walk into into the world. The third thing is generosity, graced by the prompting of the Father. You know, I remember Emma and I, we were part of uh, a church community uh, back in, in New Zealand, where we made the conscious decision that, you know, what, we're going to go around to about 20 to 25 different BP petrol stations, and we're going to hand out $10 notes to everybody who turns up uh, within, the, within the four courts. And this was a church-wide thing, so, you know, there's a lot, lot, of, lot of people that, uh, that came about. And it was just incredible that in that moment of just sharing love, Sharing compassion, it was a massive hike in, in, in prices and, and things were, were really tough for people. But just, an, just that simple act of, of, of being generous with our finance in that moment, uh, handing over $10, you just wouldn't believe the types of conversations that you had. You know, you had people, well, look, but why? Why would, you, why would you give that to us? We love you. <laughs> we want you to know that God loves you too. And... And be blessed by it. You had some people that go, oh, no, you're from the church. Oh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I don't want to borrow that. You're like, well, do you still want the $10? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, I'll take the $10. But that doesn't matter. The premise is, is just posturing yourself in a position to be generous. That, that God would, would outwork himself in and through you. 2 Corinthians 8 is, is phenomenal. Looking at the Macedonian church. He said God graced them with the ability to be generous. This was not a wealthy church by any means, but with joy, it says, they decided to give. And Paul uses it as an example to say, hey, look, I don't want to condemn you, you know, Church of Corinth, for, uh, for, for what it is you're doing, but look at the principle, look at the heart behind it. And in that place of generosity, we have seen, you know, exponential growth. And I just, I'm challenged by that, that actually uh, in my everyday walk, what does generosity stem from? Is it just to ensure that the bills get paid for people, for Chris, for Usha? Or is it actually 
from a place of, no, I love you, God, because you have given absolutely everything to me. Your love is enough, in a, even in and of its itself. Even if I didn't have a roof over my head and I had the ability to pay my rent, your love has transformed me enough that I would be generous with my time, with my finances, with my life for you. And lastly, just that act of obedience to the prompting voice of the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, I love Acts 8, and Philip with the eunuch. You know, it just, it, it, it takes this encounter with, uh, with the angel of the Lord to say, you know, to, to inform Philip, look, I want you to go to this particular place at this time, and I want you to stand by that chariot. And the obedience of Philip in that moment enabled a, a stirring within his spirit to see that God not only was for him, but wanted to express his glory in and through his life for this gentleman who was trying to unpack, uh, un, un, uh, unpack the scriptures of Isaiah. Um, and, and I also love Genesis 22 with Abraham. You know, his, God speaks to him and says, look, I want you to take your son, your one and only son, and, and, and take him up to the mountain and to sacrifice him. And, and in that, you know that there has been a, an exchange. There has been an exchange between God and Abraham, not, not only, um, not only to, to physically hear, but a, a spiritual perspective, a heavenly perspective to be able to see. Because um, we were talking about this last night with, with Tom and Shelley. It's not that we don't think that Abraham was freaking out in the premise of having to sacrifice his only son. But he chose not to partner with that, but chose to partner with the spirit that had been revealed to him. And he then is able to communicate to the two servants that were walking with him. We will worship and then we will come back to you. We will come back to you. It's not I'm coming back by myself. I'm going to be coming back with my son because I know the God that I worship. I know the God that I serve. And he's, he's unpacking. He's, he's showing me this bird's eye view. He's showing me this picture. And so, church, I, I, just as I finish, you know, this, this walk is one that can be treacherous, of course. But it's the, the revelation that as we are preaching these messages of sitting of walking and of standing, we're preparing ourselves for the times that are to come. We can't shy away that things are getting more and more difficult. And it's no government in this world, there's no power or principality of this earth that is going to be able to shift or change that. But yet God is drawing us into these heavenly places. He's drawing us to sit and to dwell with him so that when we walk when we walk in the manner that is worthy of the calling, we walk in accordance upon the foundation of his love, upon the foundation of, of, of the love that transformed you and I the very day that we gave our lives to Jesus. Do you remember that moment, church, when you gave your heart to him? And love came and revealed itself. There's nothing like it. Absolutely nothing like it. Nothing has, has compared. I can't even compare it to the day in which I stood in front of my wife and she came down the aisle. She was stunning. She was absolutely beautiful. That very moment that God met me at a youth camp on the Isle of Wight as a 12-year-old boy, He revealed his magnitude of who he was. And that despite that magnitude, he wanted me as his son. That first love, church, is to stir and transform us. Every day that we open our eyes, sit on the edge of our bed and say, Lord... What will you have me do today? Maybe you'll have me interact with a gentleman like Lucas. Maybe you'll have a work colleague who's really struggling at the moment with addiction. Maybe you have a single mom that you would just wish me to just 
pour love into. And I just, I stir this within you, church, that we would be people who walk in accordance with this manner of love. And we don't have to over-spiritualize it. This is what I'm trying to get at. We just listen. And as we listen and as we walk, He speaks to us. And He gives us exactly the thing that we need to do. And He reveals it to us, as I say. We can see it in front of our own eyes. And it has that impact to see people come into His kingdom. John 17 Jesus says, I pray that they may be one. And I pray that they would be one so that a world would see that I was sent for them. Church, when people come into these walls, do they see love? Do they see love outworked and walked amongst so that people go, hey, this community is different. This community is set apart. This community has got something that is not defined by their own flesh or by the things that they they do, but it's from a place of being that is defined by the Spirit of God. Let's just pray, shall we? Well, thanks for that, Simon. Uh, that was a really powerful word. We appreciate that. I think um, what Simon was saying there is so, so important that everything that we do, when we engage with our daily walk and we, we engage on that challenge of walking worthy of the Lord, it has to come from a genuine love. It has to come from a place, firstly, that we love God, and secondly, because we love God and because God loves us, we have the capacity to love people um, in, a, in a way that, that is just so unique, in a way that is so different. It's the love of Christ that compels us to love those who are around us. So this week, take the opportunity, as Simon was saying, Take the opportunity to show some love to somebody. Take a step out of your comfort zone and bless somebody in some way, whether it's in a small way or in a big way. And whatever you do, do it out of love. And let's see people's lives transformed and changed by the power of the Holy Spirit working through his people. Okay, we're done. Thank you for joining with us today. I hope you've had a good time with us. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've been challenged. Um, we would ask you to stay connected um, in whatever way you can. We have a number of social media platforms. We have Facebook, but most importantly, we have our YouTube channel. And there's a whole bunch of things on there from kids and youth. Um, there's still all of our old devotions if you want to go back over some of those. There's an awful lot of content, uh, content on our um, YouTube channel, and I would encourage you to check some of that out, be part of that. Um, of course, life links are running during the week, every week. That's an important part of our fellowship, important part of what we do as a church. And so if you are local and you want to get plugged in, then please contact the office and we will get you plugged into a life link where you can develop relationships and friendships um, on a more uh, close and intimate basis. Um, the website is www thebridgechurch.org.uk please email us if you have any prayer requests or anything that you would like us to respond to please stay connected let's just kind of get to know one another and just continue to build our relationship together as we go forward again as we say every week if you are local it really is time now to come back to church um, to get out of your gym jams Get out of that habit of just coming down and watching, um, you know, church on YouTube or what have you. Um, if you can now, let's come out, let's come together, let's join together. There's nothing quite like meeting together on a Sunday morning. So we would love to see you if you can. Come join us. If you can't, then we will see you next week on our midweek broadcast. Have a fantastic week. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and bring you peace. Have a brilliant week, guys. God bless. See you next week.